Hey everybody, welcome. Today is Monday, January 29th, and we're going to take a little bit of a break from the thrill of the chase, and we are going to talk uh, D.B. Cooper. We're very pleased to have uh, Pat Bolin on. She was a speaker at uh, CooperCon last year, so take it away, Capra. Yeah, so um, I did attend my second CooperCon, as you guys know, because we did a show last year. And I am very new to the game and Pat was super sweet. At, at everybody is. If you guys can make it to a Cooper con, make it because we're all a little off and we all love talking um, everything DB Cooper and everybody has their either suspects or evidence or story or interest. And it was great. So I met Pat at that time. We have chit chatted here and there since then. Um, we've tried to get this going a couple of times and we oh. finally made it work <laughs> scheduled wise. <laughs> Um, so the things I will tell you up front, Pat does not know Forrest Fenn enough to say is Forrest DB, et cetera. We have not talked about that, her and I at all, other than she knows, I think there's some connection. We've never even talked about it in detail. So do not think, she, don't ask questions about uh, what does she think about the Tina Barr newspaper article with Fenn in it. She will not have that. Well, you can ask questions. I just won't be able to answer them. <laughs> That's okay. yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, but Pat has become kind of a, a key person, I think, in the researching game of evidence. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to first let Pat introduce herself. Um, but those of you that are pure Forrest Fenners, D.B. Cooper was a hijacker from 1971, got away with the money, got a, we haven't identified him, period. We meaning... The entire United States, lots of people have their particular person they think it is, but he was never caught. That's kind of just high level. Um, I have kind of deep dived into it um, and I have bought the Gunther book and I've bought um, Bruce's book and I've lots, I have lots of books. Um, and for the community that are the DBers, there's some breaking news that Pat just told me about, which I totally want to talk about as well. So this will be um, fun to jump into. So um, Pat, please introduce yourself, how long you've been in the Cooper sure. Vortex, um, and what you're kind of interested in. And then I already have a set of questions from some things I've been wanting to ask. Okay. Well, um, my name is Pat Boland. I live in uh, Central Texas. I would lie and say that I got into this case when he jumped out of the airplane on November 24th, 1971, because I'm old enough to actually remember that. But I've, I've just had a very minimal interest over the years. I'm a huge mystery novel fan and Brit Box, and we watch all that kind of stuff. I think it was really only a couple of years ago that I saw one of the, either the Netflix flick special or one of the History Channel or something, that I just became absolutely fascinated with this. So like you, I started ordering books. I was, you know, going back and re-watching uh, Robert Stack, you know, who did the uh, old Unsolved Mysteries, which I'm sure I saw when it was first aired, and just just became absolutely addicted to it. So I went to my first CooperCon in 2022 and met a lot of the uh, main players in the case who were so gracious to me, considering I was fairly new, and never dreamed that in the year following that I would become so deep in this that I would actually be asked to be a presenter at the one in 2023. So obviously either I'm a quick study or I have nothing else to do. I can't decide which one. Nice, nice. Okay, so for our community in Forest Fen, we say we have solves um, or we look at evidence. And I think it's very similar in the D.B. Cooper community. People either have their one suspect and sometimes that changes, uh -huh. or they're looking at evidence. And the one thing I absolutely loved about your talk is how are we going to solve this through evidence? So I'd love you to talk a little bit about, especially your specific um, efforts in trying to get parachute, et cetera, and talk sure. a little bit about that. Well, people need to, to know, and I know a lot of people watching are not aware, but there's very little evidence in the case, but there is some physical evidence there. Um, Cooper asked for four parachutes. Uh, he asked for $200,000 and four parachutes. Uh, he 
jumped with one and another one is missing. So we don't know what if he threw it out the window or used it. But anyway, we still have two parachutes that were left on the plane. One that he actually interacted with quite a bit because he opened it up and used a knife to cut, you know, the shroud lines that you would see in a parachute. So he touched that a lot. The other shoe, uh, he touched minimally, but he did stick his fingers in a little slot and put, pull out what's called the packing card, which is just a little card on the shoot that says who, you know, who packed it, it was safe to use or whatever. And then there's the infamous tie, um, it, which is interesting because Cooper took a lot of his evidence with him. The ransom note, he even had a couple of matchbooks he took. So he was really careful in that aspect, yet he left his cigarette butts, which he smoked several cigarettes on the plane. And he also left a black skinny clip-on tie that had a mother of pearl tie clip on it. And the tie was, in 1971, was already kind of out of style. It was kind of geeky, I guess, because men were wearing really wide ties back then. So why he left the tie? Did he do it on purpose? Did he take it off for some reason and forget about it? I mean, we do not know. So, and then the other piece of evidence we have is actually his boarding card, because back at that time, of course, there were no electronics. It was a three-part card of which one of whom he had to give to the stewardess. So there are several items that could potentially have his DNA on it. Keeping in mind in 1971, we didn't know anything about testing for DNA. So the FBI seemed to have concentrated mostly on the tie, which makes sense. That's something he brought on the plane, which is the only thing we know of that actually existed before then. At this point, I'm not even sure that D.B. Cooper existed before November 24th, 1971, because we have we know absolutely nothing about him, where he came from, how he got to the airport. So he existed for like five hours. And then, of course, he disappeared into infamy after that. Well, the tie, you know, they tested for fingerprints. There was nothing. I guess they maybe tested from for maybe like bodily fluids, like maybe saliva or something. Anyway, there was there was nothing there. Well, fast forward, you know, um, like early, mid to 2010, somewhere around there, they actually brought in a scientist to look at the tie again, see if he could get some DNA samples. He did a lot of um, sort of vacuuming. There's a machine called an MVAC machine that you actually sort of like suck up, same, same idea as a vacuum, but suck up maybe some of the things that were on the tie. So all that was done and all that information or all that stuff they took off the tie has been analyzed quite high level. I mean, there were a lot of really weird things on that tie. A lot of um, particles and exotic metals that you or I, any, any of us would never be exposed to. They were the kind of things you find like in a research lab. It was dealing with titanium and some very rare metals. So that was very strange that all that was on the tie. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were three DNA samples, but it turned out that those were only partial. And again, back then, it just, there, there was really nothing of evidentiary value. Now, a lot of people have taken the particles and tried to connect those to maybe different companies at the time that might've been experimenting with that. And that has been like the really main focus of this in the last couple of years is what was on the tie and where were they dealing with these particles? And they have pinpointed a couple of companies. And I mean, this, this was like amazing research. Keep in mind that we are all amateurs. I have never been in law enforcement. I'm just some person who thinks this whole thing is really cool. But there's a lot of people that have spent a lot of time on the particles and have pinpointed actual suspects 
based strictly on particles they found on the tide. Yeah. So now that we're in 2024 and we're all reading about touch DNA and how they're solving all these, you know, the Golden State Killer and that guy in Long Island and all these people that are, you know, have been sitting around for 40 years and thought that nobody was ever going to catch them. All of a sudden, here they are. So the big push now, um, as you know, someone, um, Eric Eulis, actually sued the FBI about maybe a year ago to get access to the tie again, because he believed there might be some hidden DNA in a particular part of the tie that was not tested. And unfortunately, the judge decided that wasn't a good idea. So that did not happen. Um, so there are several fronts that people are looking at right now. The filters that they used to take the particles and the hopefully DNA off the tie do still exist and have been preserved. So there's a push to try to get all that tested using this kind of cutting edge technology, um, metagenomics, which is where they literally, if you have multiple strands of DNA, they actually separate them apart. And then the idea is if they can get actual DNA profiles and they can bring in a forensic genealogist who, you know, figures out your 10th cousin because you put your DNA and, uh, you know, ancestry or whatever. And bingo, we're going to figure out who Cooper is. The problem is this is extremely expensive. Like they're talking about even to do a very small sample, $50,000 and up. There are very few labs that actually do this because in the US, most of the DNA labs are really paternity type labs. They're not dealing with the public with this sort of endeavor. Most of these labs only deal with law enforcement. So that's an issue. Um, something else people are looking at, there's something called an ancient DNA lab, which they typically deal with dinosaur bones and you know that type of thing. But there is a human application to possibly look at this. The problem is what they are typically looking at with these, these particular labs is they're looking at actual samples from someone's body. You know, you'll hear about there was a skeleton found or they go back and they retest the bodily fluids in a, in a murder or, you know, a rape or something. But we don't have that. We have a tie. We don't have like a, a skull or, you know, a saliva sample or something. So that's what's going to be really complicated. My understanding is with the tie, it, it's it's a huge long shot, and it's also um, prohibitively expensive. So what I was working on with CooperCon is someone else is taken on the tie, and that's great. I mean, I think we need to we need to investigate every avenue. Is there are two parachutes that we not only know Cooper touched, but one of them he literally cut open and they were with a knife cut through if you if you are interested the citizen salutes website has tons of pictures of these parachute cords and they are twisted and you can see where he cut through with the knife he he brought with him and we are completely well are we i am completely convinced that there are skin cells with the way that those shroud lines are woven and he would have to hold them really taut to be able to think about right. slicing through. And, so there's DNA from. Exactly, with a pocket knife. And we're not talking about, you know, he brought like a machete or something. So he had to have really gripped these. And I mean, we have talked to DNA labs, we've talked to forensic genealogists, they have said, I mean, it, all they need are like two skin cells. I mean, this is how crazy it is now. And since these shroud lines are so long, chances are that maybe even if 
we know the FBI agents touch them, but what are the chances that they all touch them in exactly the same place? Because they're very long, they're, you know, they're long, it's a parachute. So obviously they're, you know, uh, multiple lines and multiple places he cut. So that was kind of our, now, unfortunately, the parachute that I'm talking about is in the FBI custody as evidence. So that is not available to us right now. Um, but there is another parachute that he did also touch, which is currently in the possession of the Washington State History Museum in Tacoma. We were about to get permission to go over and do some testing on that uh, before CooperCon, and we are not sure why, but at the last minute, they pulled out from letting us do that. It's actually not on display. It's in their, re they have a research facility. It's kind of interesting. They said there's only a couple of items that they have that no one is allowed to see or touch. And guess what? The Cooper shoot is one of them. So this case, I mean, everybody says there's like a Cooper curse because it seems like no matter what we try to do, somebody puts a monkey wrench in it. So our feel, my feeling is we're looking at triangulation. We know back in 71, nobody was wearing gloves, the FBI, you know, people were passing these things around. They didn't use modern, you know, techniques. We all know why. But if the same person's DNA is on the tie and one of those shoots, and, you know, what are the chances that right. somebody touched all of these things? I would say very, 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 very slim. So that's kind of where we are right now. Now, the breaking news. Yeah, and somebody asked we, in chat, isn't the FBI case closed? Well, if you would read the article that came out yesterday, there's a, uh, I believe it's only an online publication, but easy to look up. It's called the U.S. Sun. I just posted a link to it in the chat. So okay, they have it. been like the last month, almost every day is a Cooper article. The tie, they've talked about different suspects. I mean, but yesterday they said, and I read it several times because I couldn't believe it myself, that a former, a retired special agent from the FBI who worked on the case, so obviously he's very familiar with it, said the case really isn't actually closed. It was administratively closed. In other words, they weren't actively, I guess, looking at it, but if something popped up, they're looking at it. And we, we don't know what's going on. The FBI, of course, did not respond to, uh, you know, attempts to make a statement, which we know why. And I mean, I have the utmost respect for law enforcement and the FBI. I know they have a lot of much more important things to do than the Cooper case, um, which I wish they didn't, but they do. Yeah. So uh, that's where we are on that. So with the article, the gentleman who was interviewed, again, he is retired, but he was uh, surmising that perhaps they are testing the stuff themselves, that there's been enough publicity lately, enough articles, the lawsuit certainly got their attention because they did have to address the suit. Um, and it did go before a judge, just like a regular lawsuit. And she, you know, took a while, but she, you know, finally gave her ruling. So I don't know, I think if I was an FBI agent, and I knew and Obviously, they know what's going on in the world of uh, forensics and genealogy more than we do, that they would actually say, you know what, let's just test that tie again. So that that could be happening, I think, as we speak. Now, I'm, I feel fairly sure they're watching us right now. So hopefully they're hearing about the parachutes. And um, because I think that's the holy grail is the shoot that they have in a banker's box because the tie has been it's been passed around it's been on display at the uh, FBI museum in DC I mean there's a lot of um you know lore or uh, 
you know, urban legends about maybe somebody wore the tie to a Halloween party. I, I don't know that that's true, but I'm just saying that the tie became sort of the, you know, you, you pictured Cooper with the skinny black tie on, you know. So I think the shoot, since it was so well preserved, and so few people have really messed with it because if you look at the pictures, like I said, on that citizen sleuth, I mean, the, the inside of the shoot part, the canopy, it's pretty big. I mean, it's all kind of rolled up. So nobody's like really pulling that apart every day and looking at it like they would be doing with the tie, you know, the, looking at the clip, looking at. So that's where I think the. Um, Have you asked that's about I think the first DNA. That first parachute that you say is with the FBI, not that they would say yes if they say no to the tie to Eric, but has there been any inquiry about, can we analyze the parachute with the cords that you have, or did you just focus at the museum? We only focused on the museum shoot because we felt like that was our best shot, just yeah. because we actually could talk to someone on the phone who wasn't an FBI agent. And, you know, they were... Um, it was it was odd. They were not um, extremely forthcoming. They did tell me initially that I could easily make an appointment to see it. The things in the research lab are only available like, you know, two hours on Wednesday or something. So I was already I had a scientist, the, the scientist who was allowed to examine the tie by the FBI. He was going to come with me. So, I mean, it wasn't me going over there and you know, taking DNA samples. This was the man that the FBI trusted with their evidence to test it. He is the gentleman who has the filters. He has the supposed DNA samples. So, and the museum was very familiar with him because he'd actually done presentations there because they they have had, you know, displays and different, um, you know, activities involving D.B. Cooper since he is kind of a Washington legend or whatever. So they were kind of on board when they heard that he was involved in it. But then at the last minute, they just said, uh, we can't do that. And then they kind of ghosted us. So I have followed up a bit and I spoke with someone. He was like really excited about it. And then he would never take my call again or respond to my email. So I'm not really sure now that we have all this extra information, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what's going on. Well, there's um, tons of questions in chat. So let's get to a couple of them. Some of them are kind of basic DB stuff. And then some, okay, of, them sure. some of the stuff you talked about, but okay. question from Vista Homes, what does the B stand for in DB Cooper? And uh, Pat, do you know also that D.B. Cooper wasn't white. He was olive skinned, but not white. Is that so the description they gave, olive skinned? Most definitely. Hmm. Um, well, first of all, Cooper's name on his boarding pass was Dan Cooper. Oh. I mean, that's that's his, well, that's not his real name, but that hmm. was the name that he used. For some reason when, you know, it was kind of like playing telephone when the, um, Reporters came in, it got translated, somebody misheard somebody, and it ended up in the newspaper as D.B. Cooper, which kind of sounds more, you know, kind of cool, I think, than Dan Cooper. Yeah. Sounds like your <laughs> CPA or somebody. So um, that's how that happened. And then the other question, yes, the description was a word that I personally have never used, except in the last two years, is swarthy. Mm -hmm. um, one of the witnesses said that they felt he could be, um, back then we would have said American Indian, but Native American possibly had some, you know, maybe mixed race or um, one person said maybe, you know, Italian, Latin. So yes, he definitely had, was darker complected. That is, that is correct. Interesting. That, that's from the, you know, we have, there were several witnesses. I mean, there were three mm -hmm. stewardesses. The interesting thing is they didn't, nobody on the, none of the passengers knew they were being hijacked, which was pretty smart on his part. So the rest of the witnesses are not that great. I mean, if you were in the middle of a crime, you'd be paying attention. They had no reason to look at this guy. He was sitting in the back row by the restroom. 
So, you know, the, the best witness was the college student, and you know who he is, Chris, because he's, you, he came and spoke at CooperCon, that he was sitting across the aisle from him, and he actually noticed him quite a bit because the stewardess was quite an attractive young blonde lady, and he couldn't figure out why she was sitting with this kind of geeky looking guy instead of paying attention to him. So he was probably, he is definitely our best yeah. non-stewardess wit witness. Um, and to come forward, Tina is not as enthusiastic in um, the community as much as he is. He is funny. I've watched him talk twice. Second time he said, I don't know what I'm going to say. It's the same story. I'm like, <laughs> any words you say are going to be great because we'll pick them apart. Just go, get up there. And oh, yeah. I mean, it's did. it's funny to hear, you know, that he was he he talks about the turkey neck. Because, yeah. you know, he was, of course, sitting across or saying something from the side. But he keeps talking about that he had a weird what he would say, a turkey gobble or something, which nobody else really noticed. But again, he was trying to figure out. Why is she not looking at me? Because remember right. the steward, they were all in their early 20s. And I call them stewardesses because back then that's what they that's called what them. Yep. They were very young. I think Tina was maybe 21 or 22. Right. And of course, all very attractive uh, yep. young ladies. Um, Tina has, and I understand why. I mean, she was really, um, you know, people in the media and people writing books and crazy people were trying to contact her. So she... Um, she's been on a couple of TV shows, interviewed. Um, she's kept a pretty low profile in her life. Now, interestingly, in her, because she's in her 70s now, there is a movie being made about her. It's called Not If You Understand, which I don't really know why they call it, because I don't think we're ever said that. But because he actually gave the ransom note to the other stewardess. But anyway, Tina was the one who sat with him through the, you know, she's she was in the trenches with with Cooper. And there is a movie being made. I know it kind of got interrupted with the writer's strike. I ha I don't have any latest updates, but my understanding is it's still going forward. It actually has quite a um, I don't know that there's anybody like really famous that of the actors, but the producers are quite big Hollywood heavy hitters. So it sounds like this may be like a, um, not a direct to video type movie, that this will actually be like a feature production. So that's gonna be really interesting because I don't know, I don't know what she's gonna say that we don't already know. So that could be really interesting. Well, that's equivalent to us. She's kind of for the Fenners in here. She's kind of the Zoe of not really in the community, but has, could have something very interesting to say. So yeah, there's oh, totally. I mean, she sat with that guy for hours. They smoked yeah. a cigarette together. Um, you know, we don't we don't know if there's something else. Yeah. I, I mean, I I think she's a lovely lady, and I would never say that she didn't uh, you know, I'm I'm sure she gave multiple interviews to the FBI and they they hounded her for years. Is this you know, every time they came up with a new suspect, they brought picture to her right. so I mean she was involved in this for years I just wonder maybe as she's gotten older she's kind of seeing him because he was a middle-aged man which was very strange and, and we were all once in our early 20s and you know you interact differently maybe now in hindsight that she is older maybe she's seeing something different that she didn't see at the time so we don't know well, this is an interesting point because I think it's one that you made a little bit ago, but uh, David Pisano, I saw your back. Congratulations. Thanks for taking a little break, but coming back, David. Um, he is one of our tubers in our community. Oh, okay. What, the chain of custody for the tie. And I think this is one of the issues you have with the tie. Oh, it, it's, there isn't one. I mean, <laughs> that thing flew around more than I think Northwest Orient did. I mean, it, it kept being moved from one office to another. Again, it was probably in an envelope. I mean, people weren't using gloves. Um, you know, it had the fingerprint silver nitrate that they used for fingerprint powder on it. So no, there is no chain of custody. So I think what I'm a little bit afraid of is because we have had so many suspects that, well, the FBI had over a thousand and they know what they're doing, but I'm talking about just people like me or anyone else who 
you know, is coming up with, and, and there's at least one crazy suspect a week on the D.B. Cooper Mystery Group Facebook page. <clears throat> I'm just afraid that maybe, you know, it's going to be, oh, this is him because we found the DNA on the tie, if they ever could do that. And it would turn out to be like the guy who worked at J.C. Benny who sold him the tie. I mean, we, we just don't know. So, no, the chain of custody is there basically isn't one. I think yeah. that's the answer. <laughs> Yeah. Now, will that interfere with the DNA test, though, that they want to do on it? Well, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. somebody explained to me that this is the equivalent of taking 50 fingerprints of 50 different people and putting them all on top of each other. Oh, I mean, geez. that's how they have to separate out this DNA. It's extremely complicated. And I just don't know how this is really going to work. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we did find a lab when we were thought we were going to get something off the parachute, but they only deal with law enforcement or active or attorneys with active, you know, cases. Um, but when we told them, because first they turned us down. Then when we told them, well, it's D.B. Cooper's parachute, they were like, oh, OK, we're in. So, you know, hopefully there's going to be a, a lab that just says, yeah, we want the free publicity. We want the notoriety that we solve the case, which, you know, kind of we all do, I guess. So. Well, and someone asked, what is your thoughts on the Tina Barr money? And they kept it that vague. Oh, no, I mean, I, for those of you who don't know, I mean, Cooper disappeared with the $200,000. He and the money have never been seen again, except a little boy in, I think it was, can't remember now, is it 1980? was with his family, he was like eight years old. Tina Barr is a, um, you know, it's, it's a beach. It's kind of a, you know, families have picnics or, you know, it's just kind of a little sandbar type place. And a little boy was kind of digging in the sand and he found what looked like corroded, basically corroded money. So one thing led to another and his parents, um, really weren't familiar with the Cooper case. They were new to the area, but anyway, figured out that maybe that, well, it turned out to be $6,000 of Cooper's money. That's the only money that has ever shown up. And I mean, the FBI put out lists because the, the money was recorded. I mean, they had the serial numbers. So all the banks were alerted, casinos, you know, places where you might try to sort of launder this money or use this money. None of it has ever shown up. The Tina Barr thing is, I mean, it's a mystery inside of a mystery. I mean, there's all sorts of theories that for whatever reason, Cooper, um, you know, dug a hole the night of the hijacking and, and buried the money. But then, you know, when he came back to get it, he forgot to get that part. There's ideas that, you know, it flew out because he had the money tied in the bag. Um, I don't, nobody knows. I mean, you'll ask a hundred people and get a hundred different answers, but that is just the mystery of, um, again, within a mystery. And I mean, I, I've, I've kind of toyed with the idea that maybe um, somebody planted it there on purpose that the FBI was kind of getting close and they did have some suspects that they, in fact, there's three people that they have never officially eliminated as suspects. Um, that one of them may have felt that they were getting too close to him and might have planted the money because planting the money right next to a river might really seriously imply that he drowned, which is what they thought initially that he, no way that this guy, but you know, there's never been a body, there's there's not, never been a parachute, there's nothing. A lot of people think he died. He, but you know, there, contrary to popular opinion, there are not a lot of bodies of water in that area. I mean, there are some, but the vast majority of the whole drop zone area really is land. So where is this guy? But that could be what happened is that the money fell into the river and somehow through natural means it ended up, you know, because water does weird things, as we know.
Yeah, so. especially over time, over decades and things. Yeah. Well, there are some questions about what evidence, and I'm going to put a couple of things out there because I know the FBI has said they've lost some of it, et cetera, but is the plane seat still around that they could get DNA from? And what do you mean there's no fingerprints on the drink glass that I think the FBI has lost? At this okay, point? no, all right. No, the plane seats are no longer around. Oddly, there were not a, a lot of fingerprints on the plane. There were a lot of partial prints, which I find very strange because that was the last leg of a very busy day. I mean, that flight originated in D.C. and I think made like five stops or something. So a lot of people would have used the restroom or had reason to touch things. So that's kind of strange. My theory is that Cooper wiped down a lot of stuff before he left. I think that may be one reason how he left his tie. I think he might have used, but that's just me. Um, no, so that does not exist. There was a drink glass. We know he did have a, a bourbon and seven up on the plane. Um, I have actually spoken with a stewardess when I was in Seattle um, at the Boeing Museum, who was a contemporary of the stewardesses on flight 305 that did say they, they use plastic cups because I was kind of, you know, I don't know. I wasn't on a plane back then and that they would mix the drinks for you. They didn't hand you the little bottle and the seven up or whatever. There was a cup. They looked at the cups. They said there were no prints on them. I personally have taken a plastic cup <laughs> and put, you know, ice and water in it. And I could literally see my fingerprints on the outside of the cup. So I don't know what that means. Um, you know, he paid with a, he paid with a $20 bill for his ticket. He also paid with a $20 bill on the plane for a drink that cost a dollar, which is very odd. Those $20 bills, they said they really couldn't separate out from the rest of the $20 bills. I don't think there were two, because paying with a $20 bill back then was like paying with a hundred right, right now. So all that, the cigarette butts were thrown away. That's according to the FBI files. They said they were not of evidentiary value. That could have solved the case. I mean, if the butts are, were out there, yeah. those are gone. Now there is a hair. There's a hair that's in a slide that supposedly is still around. I mean, if there's no information, it was ever destroyed. Someone in the group who's an attorney has filed under the Freedom of Information Act to get the slide. The FBI has said, we'll look for it. Um, that's the last that we've, so that's still out there. We have been told by a very prominent forensic genealogist, if you can get us the hair, I can get you a name. So, I mean, keep your fingers crossed. That could be the big break in the case. Unfortunately, right now, I'm sure looking for the slide is not a big priority and we don't know. I mean, I'm afraid it got stuck in another case file. And so, you know, some crazy person who did something and then, I mean, how would you ever find it? So I don't know, but we're keeping our fingers crossed on that. Well, there's three different FBI um, agency locations that were also involved, right? So Las well, Vegas, that's... oddly, um, and then the other two up north. And so it could be somewhere between one of the locations. Well, and that's a really good point. And that's the other thing. I don't even know 100% where the parachute is. I mean, I even had my congressman's office help me and they they were able to get through to the FBI museum in DC and it, it's extremely vague. I, first we said, they said it was in DC. Now it seems like it might be in Seattle. You know, the Reno office was involved because of course that's where, you know, the plane landed after he jumped. There's Las Vegas, of course there's Seattle. So we don't even know where this stuff is. So you're right. Transporting between, um, you know, I mean, I know they worked really hard on this case, but you have to assume after a few years, the priority of this had to really drop just because everybody figured out, you know what, he's dead. But I mean, this is the only unsolved hijacking mm -hmm. in the US. And I've always read that there are three cases unsolved crimes in the U.S. that are the most 
you know, people want to solve, people are interested in, and it's, where's Jimmy Hoffa? Yep. What happened to Amelia Earhart? And number three, who the heck was D.B. Cooper? So yep. Yep. it's a big deal. Yeah. So uh, one that I thought was intriguing, you did a Facebook Live a few days ago. And do you believe D.B. Cooper acted alone? I think there had to be somebody else involved in this. Uh, the fact that there nobody knows how he got to the airport. Again, I keep reminding people, this was a middle-aged man. If you look at the copy, you know, there were several people after who decided to pull the same stunt and jump, jump out of an airplane. None of them got away with it. And almost all of them were either very young, had, you know, were Vietnam vets with PTSD. I mean, this, this guy was the unicorn, not to mention the fact he got away with it, but he was, he was a middle-aged man. So, you know, I think, I just think we have to, you know, we have to keep that in perspective of when we're talking about this. So I don't know how he got to the airport. I do not believe that anybody would think they could pull off this stunt and not have a plan of what was going to happen when they hit the ground. Right. You know, oh, gee, I think I'll hijack a plane, but well, I don't know. I'll figure it out once I, you know, I, I'm just not seeing that. This is not some crazy kid that's, you know, decides to just go rob a liquor store and doesn't really think it through. This had to be thought through. I think Cooper had to have had parachute experience. Um, it just too many things that he did point to. Of course, he had extreme knowledge of that airplane because this was not common knowledge that you could open, fly with the, you know, the stairs down. I mean, yeah. even, you know, the people who work there didn't know that for obvious reasons. This is not the type of thing that you want everybody to know about. So he had to have known that. Um, so I don't know. I think there's a very good chance because a lot of his plan, things seem like he thought him through, but he didn't think him through all the way, which leads me to believe that maybe there was someone else who was kind of a, an accomplice that was helping him put this plan together. So that's, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, an old army buddy, I certainly think, because people say, well, you know, the only way to keep a secret with two people is you have to kill one of them, right? Um, but I think a spouse could have been involved or, you know, even like a, a family member. I, I don't know. I think a lot of people do commit crimes with other, with accomplices and, and they, they keep their mouth shut, you know? Well, a very famous quote that Forrest Fenn says is two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. And that is exactly. what just reference. Yeah. So that is yeah, very that's exactly right. Now, question, for, question from the chat. Have you read the Ha 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 book? I have not. Okay. I've, it's pretty hard to find, isn't it? I mean, it's, I've, I've looked it up online, but I, I haven't seen a whole lot of copies. Of it. Yeah, they're out there. I think they were hard to find. I don't know. I think they're out there now. But Okay. Well, I'll put that on my list of things I need to read, but. No, I, I have not read that. I mean, I'm I'm somewhat familiar with it. I've read about it, but I have not read it. So one of the things that I think there's a lot of parallels with, we have a mystery in our group, you have a mystery in your group. One of the things that happened in your group, or I should say ours, but you know what I mean, uh -huh. um, that th there was a Netflix documentary that came out. What right. did you see the community, and we have that coming out this summer, that's and true. so what do you see, how do you see the community, like, what was the experience of the community? I'm, I was like number two or three on Netflix, or maybe it was. Oh, I know. And did you see a lot of new people come in? Did it change things? What it, did you get? Obviously you didn't get all the answers because everybody's still there. What, how did you see it affect from a person researching standpoint? Okay. Well, I, I was not really active in the case when that documentary came out. I can only speak to since I've been in it. I mean, the at least the Facebook group is kind of exploded. So, I mean, I'm even talking to like younger people and they know about the case. There's a bookstore not far from where I'm kind of a little independent bookstore. And they were doing like a crime night or something. They had so many people want tickets to hear about D.B. Cooper 
that they, I mean, they had to do like another one. And then I couldn't even get tickets the second time. I mean, it was kind of crazy. So there was a lot of interest in this case. Um, so yeah, I would, well, I mean, anytime Netflix is going to do a special like that, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to, uh, you know, just go, oh, I'm, I'm not familiar with this, or I want to learn more about it. So certainly the notoriety has got to, uh, got to have helped. Yeah. Um, and so the 302s that are coming out, can you talk to this a little bit for those that um, aren't aware, you know, the, the case okay. closes. So then, you know, these 302s, which are kind of like the FOIAs that we do in our community, very similar. Can you talk to that? Because I guess there's so many pages that comes out every month. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, a 302 is basically just a piece of paper with, you know, information like a form or whatever that the FBI, you know, uses either, um, it, it's, you know, the report, it's a report is what it is. And so some of them are, you know, inter go from one office to another, some of them go, you know, different files, suspect files, but, you know, they're not available to the general public because, you know, this is a, this is a criminal case. And by the way, D.B. Cooper was a criminal. I am not someone who thinks he was some James Bond hero or anything. Um, several years ago, I'm, I'm not sure how many, not that many years ago, um, a lawsuit was filed against the FBI that the case, this group of people who were kind of a citizen sleuth group, but, but a lot of very prominent people, former law enforcement and, and attorneys and things, filed a lawsuit that they were not able to solve the case because they didn't have this information. Well, actually they won. Um, now the caveat is they're only releasing 500 pages a month. So we may be all really old by the time, I'm already really old, but really old by the time these are all released. But those have changed the case dramatically because every month you're going, Oh my gosh, we didn't know this. I mean, it's all the interviews, all the, you know, a thousand suspects, all the different people that they looked at, all the, you know, who do they show a photograph to? All the, of course, all the interviews with the crew. I mean, the, the the cockpit never saw Cooper. That was another really smart thing he did. He never interacted with anyone except those three young ladies. He did not uh, interact with the FBI in any way. Um, so that was pretty smart. But so we're, that's where we're getting all this information. The problem is they're not always, you know, they're open to interpretation. And the way that they did the 302s is they didn't record any interviews or anything, you know, tape record. So they would interview you and they would take notes. Yep. Then they'd go back to the office and it might be two days later, they have somebody, you know, type it up. So you'll find conflicting information in there or things that can be interpreted one way or the other. But the whole point being, the fact that we have all these is huge. It's huge. Um, do so, they have a timeline of how long, like if it's 500 pages a month, do they have, I mean, is it going to go on for? Yeah, like, I mean, so, I think years? somebody told me like seven more years or something, but I, I'm not really sure. There's tens of thousands of pages. I mean, this is how, how much they looked into this case. So people who say, well, you know, they messed up or they didn't really, you know, it's a conspiracy. I mean, they really, really, really put in a huge effort to solve this case. I think Cooper succeeded because he was the first one. You know, they did, this was, I mean, there were a lot of hijackings in the 60s a lot, but they were typically people hijacking the plane, mostly to go to Cuba. I mean, that was the big thing. Um, and the idea that somebody was going to jump out of the plane was, you know, there was a gentleman like about a week before in Canada that kind of attempted this, but he was foiled before he could actually jump. But this was the first person. So I think the FBI was just, you know, like anything else. I mean, they can't anticipate everyone's possible move in the criminal world. So they were not, you know, anticipating this at all. The fact that the rest of the copycats after him were caught speaks to that they 
got up to speed pretty fast. So that's that's the story on the on all that. Well, one I find particularly this is the last thing on my on my list, and we're getting close to the end anyway. Um, because somebody did say, is there any Oswald connection? Well, it's funny you mentioned that. Let's talk just a little bit about um, okay. Well, about you know, there's my Oswald connection, there's two of them. Number one, Cooper jumped on November 24th, which is the anniversary of Ruby shooting Oswald. So there is that, which, you know, could be a coincidence. But like I said, a one out of 365 chance that it would be the same day. And number two, there was a very odd story, which is peddled around, but it's in the 302s. And they looked at it quite extensively. As there was a gentleman who ran a skydiving school at Elsinore. Um, and he uh, said that a couple of months before the hijacking, a gentleman showed up who was asking some really strange questions about jumping out of airplanes and just things that people are not normally, you know, commercial airlines. Obviously, this is skydiving school, you're jumping out of air. But, you know, commercial jets, which who's doing this, right? Of course, he fit the description. He also had some Raleigh cigarette coupons in his pocket, whereas Cooper smoked Raleigh cigarettes. So, you know, they call, they refer to this man as the Elsinore ghost because nobody knows who he is. So at, right after the hijacking, the gentleman who ran the school, who just happened to be like an FBI informant, who actually happened to be the last person to talk to Jack Ruby before he shot Oswald. But I'm not into conspiracies or anything. But anyway, so they had, you know, stacks. I don't even remember how many thousands of, I guess every time you skydive, you had to fill out some sort of card. So they went through those things. They narrowed it down, narrowed it down. They finally got it down to like 11 guys who fit, you know, the age, the height. You know, most people skydiving back then, you know, these were, were young kids, you know, early 20s or whatever, not a 40 something year old man. Anyway, basically nothing came out of it because they weren't the only people that they pinpointed as being possibilities had alibis. So that went nowhere, but nobody ever figured out who this guy was. But there are so many crazy stories, coincidences yep. that I just, I mean, it's its sort of mind blowing, I think. Well, but the, that's... Funny, the, the two coincidences that I have is I have skydived once when I was 19 and it happened to be at that Elsinore jump school. And the second okay. coincidence is one of the suppliers of the Thai manufacturer that Eric found um, is Aerojet, which is a company I used to work for, um, which I just found fascinating that there's, uh -huh. you know, seven degrees of separation. Something's going to happen. Oh, and in this, it isn't even seven degrees. It's usually like one or two. I mean, that that's how that's how weird everything is. I mean, you just look at things and you, you kind of get to the point, you just kind of shake your head. So... Yeah. We don't know who Cooper is, but I think I think we can find him with find out who he is, because to me, the biggest mystery in this case is not that Cooper was never caught. The biggest mystery is that he has never been identified. I right. mean, we have absolutely no idea who this and that to me, I I cannot explain that, that we have no idea. I mean. He can't, he, I keep saying he was somebody's child. He went to school with people. He had to have a job at some point in his life. I mean, just like he, he's a complete and total ghost. So okay. hopefully with between the tie, the parachutes, if the FBI is maybe saying, let's go back and retest a lot of this stuff. Um, I don't know. Let's what hope. See, we, what do you see happening? This is how we'll wrap it up. What do you see happening this year for DB Cooper? Do you see any big breakthroughs? Do you see, I mean, we always joke we're on only day 1300 or 1500 or something mm -hmm. since our mystery started. Uh, you guys are on year 53. So yeah, I know. I, I, know. Uh, I, I do think I, there's been too much happening lately. That's been like super interesting. So I do think with the new technology, if um, they maybe are going to be able to test the filters they have from the tie, 
I, I what I think is going to happen is one morning I'm going to get up and turn on the news and start screaming, oh, my gosh, the FBI is announced they have solved the Cooper case. I mean, that's what I think is going to happen. I mean, I'm certainly under, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to solve it or, you know, you're going to solve it. We may have spurred them along by just the publicity that we're giving. And so we'll take credit, right, where where we can. But um, I mean, I that's what I think is going to happen. Unless somebody comes out of the woodwork and said, I was in my grandpa's at cleaning out the attic and I found some $20 bills in a parachute and it turns out to be, but I think the time for that has really passed. I, I think it, it's it's the DNA. I mean, that's that's what it is because that's what's solving all these other cases. Yeah. So I think that's where we are. But yeah, I think a lot in, in this 2024, I think it's going to be real interesting. So. Well, great. Well, I want to say thank you so much. Your talk was fabulous at CooperCon. And I know I don't, I'm not too much on Facebook is the problem. So I don't get as much there. Um, but there is a lot coming out. I know we finally made this work tonight. Thank you. Um, and so where can someone find you if okay. you are engaging for, you know, Cooper Talk? Sure. Um, like I said, there. if you're on Facebook, <clears throat> there's the D.B. Cooper Mystery Group Facebook page, which has, which has almost 5,000 people on it. I mean, it's not my page, but I am a member of the page and have somehow am considered to be an expert, which I find to be quite interesting and amusing. Um, but anyway, I do know a lot about the case. Um, and it's quite active. I mean, I'm sure there have been multiple posts just in the time I'm on here. So that would be a good uh, way to find me, I think. Um, I, I have people message me a lot. I, I don't mind answering questions. If I don't know, I can maybe find out. I can't tell you who Cooper was, but... Um, Somebody said, which I thought was pretty smart, that he knows absolutely everything about this case, except who D.B. Cooper is. The only thing that really matters is what we don't know. So it's kind of amusing. But yeah, check out the uh, D.B. Cooper mystery group. And I have several Facebook lives on there. We do those pretty regularly. Uh, different people do, not just me, but talk about different aspects of the case. Because there, there's a lot of... Um, it's an intellectual case if you're into aviation or you're into flight paths or like you say the tina bar money the uh if you're a metallurgist i mean jump on in because all that stuff on the tie that we have no idea if you know anything about dna so there's a lot of room for not just people going well i'm going to find out who this guy is that actually we can use capabilities of people who have real qualifications yeah. um so you might just find the science of it interesting so I would suggest that probably be the best way to find it. Excellent. And anything big that happens, we will do an update here, guys. Okay. Uh, the Calazar's channel, just to make sure that, um, you know, whatever big comes up. We only do probably three or four shows a year that are on pure DB, but um, I'm fascinated with it. Um, I know that I, we can't say it's a totally victimless crime, but I worked with another searcher to try to help um, find Gabby Petito and oh, gosh. Boyfriend, and that... <laughs> It was so hard at the end. We were actually in the right park and, you know, finding him. And that turned out that truly had victims and it, it, it that affected me. Well, more. I mean, it, not, not to disagree with you, but the people that were on that plane, the, the uh, crew and they, I think they were pretty psychologically affected, but you have to keep in mind that Cooper was the domino for all these copycats and some yeah. people did get killed. Yeah after yes. this so yes. he set in motion a chain of events that was quite devastating ruined families a uh, innocent woman was killed i mean a lot of that stuff happened so you know victimless crime i i mean I like want, I said, that's why i say it's not a pure one but you're not going to deal no, with it's, it's not a it's not a murder mystery exactly. which is why i i couldn't deal with that all all day like i'm doing this no it's not a murder mystery um, it's not anything like that, but it's amazing how many people think this guy's like pretty cool. Um, so, you know, to each his own, I think. Yeah. I don't go as far as he's this hero, that sort of thing, but it, it's fun to kind of dig into the research, knowing that you're not going to have to be dealing with 
Exactly. The, the I, I don't want to do Zodiac or some other, you know, right, kook, right. crazy per. No, I don't want to think about stuff like that. But yeah, if you can just separate that out, which is pretty easy because the stuff we talk about is, but you know, when you, when you actually contemplate it, you think, oh my gosh, this guy, he, he was a bad guy. I mean, he was. Yeah. Wherever yeah. he is, I don't know. Cooper, where are you? Wasn't that the name of the yeah, Netflix? I think that was the name of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, thank you again. Well, you thank you so much for time. having me on. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It was great. Thank you. Well, you all take care. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. All right. All, right. all right, everybody. The mystery continues. We'll see you next week, next Monday. Thanks for tuning in.